May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be always pleasing to you, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Please be seated. Today is the first Sunday of Advent. And Advent is a season of waiting and preparation. We most often speak of Advent as a season of preparing for the celebration of the Christmas feast, the remembrance of the birth of Christ. But Advent is also a time of waiting and preparation for the return of Christ. Every week we say, Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. And on this first Sunday of Advent is the perfect time to look at what it means that Christ will come again. Christ has come. He was born to Mary and Joseph. He taught and preached and healed throughout Galilee. He had a beautiful ministry, walking from town to town and revealing to more and more people this wonderful way of knowing God present among us. Repent, for the kingdom of God has come near, he said. And then he was crucified, died, and rose again. Christ has come. That happened. We also know that Christ will come again and again. Because Christ is revealed each time we see the divine in another person. Christ is revealed each time we seek and serve Christ in all persons, loving our neighbor as ourselves. Christ is revealed when we strive for justice and peace, respecting the dignity of every human being. Christ has come, and Christ will come again. The, the coming of Christ is, something, is both something that has happened and will happen again. And that is the deeper truth of Advent. Christ was born and showed us a new way to participate in the coming of God's kingdom by loving God and by loving our neighbor as ourselves. But that kingdom is not fully realized. This kingdom we live in knows the kingdom of God, but is not yet transformed by the kingdom of God. We live in a world of injustice, inequity, and suffering. For the first readers of the Gospel of Mark, their world, was in turmoil. Jerusalem was besieged and destroyed in that time. There was indeed great suffering. They needed the promise of the return of Christ. In our world, we hear daily of injustices and inequities of people killed by police because of the color of their skin, of families consigned to poverty by policies and behaviors of banks and banking officials that deny them mortgages. We hear of superstorms driven by global warming, destroying vast swaths of Central America, just recently, Guatemala and Honduras. We live in a world devastated by pandemic. The point of all of this is that we too need the promise of the return of Christ. On this first Sunday of Advent, we need both the truth of Christ's birth and the promise of the return of Christ. We need the truth of Christ's birth so that we can follow him in the way of love. And we need the promise that Christ will come again as we live with the injustices and suffering of this world. And that 
exactly what we find in today's reading from Mark. Our gospel reading today is the final verses of chapter 13 of Mark's gospel. And this chapter is, is called the Little Apocalypse. Apocalyptic literature like the book of the Revelation to John and this chapter in Mark, the book of Daniel, they speak particularly to people who are suffering. They speak particularly in times of suffering. The word apocalypse today brings to mind the end of the world, cataclysm and destruction. And that makes sense. That's what you find in the apocalyptic literature, descriptions of devastation, of great suffering, of wars and famines and earthquakes. The word apocalypse means revelation. And the point of the apocalyptic literature is that all of this destruction, these wars and famines and earthquakes, these plagues are revealing something. Mark's chapter 13, the little apocalypse, is the revelation of the hope of Christ's return. This chapter begins, chapter 13 begins with Jesus and his disciples coming out of the temple, and one of the disciples looks up and sees the great stones of the temple and he's just, he's impressed. He says, teacher, what large stones and what large buildings. I'm imagining these Galileans, fishermen and farmers and tradesmen who followed Jesus to Jerusalem, just impressed by the grandeur of the temple complex. But Jesus replies, do you see these great buildings? Not one stone will be left here upon another. All will be thrown down. And with that, Jesus begins to describe the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple. Now, Mark was the earliest of the four Gospels. Most people believe that it was written around, somewhere around the year 60, just before the destruction of Jerusalem, or possibly during the siege of Jerusalem. See, that was a terrible time that began in the year 66 with another in a series of Jewish uprisings against Rome. And Rome's reaction to this, the, the uprising in 66, was to besiege Jerusalem. Okay. During a siege, they close off the city, and no one can come in or out. The people in the city are left to fend for themselves, to starve slowly over the weeks and months of the siege. And this went on from 66 to the year 70, when finally the Romans just destroy the city. They knock down the gates. They destroy the temple complex. And as Jesus said, not one stone was left on another. And so the destruction and the suffering of Jesus describes in this little apocalypse is an experience that the first readers of Mark would have been intimately familiar with. It was the life they were living. It was either the, the outcome of the turmoil they were living in, or it was literally what was happening around them as they first heard this gospel. Now, earlier in this chapter 13 of Mark, Jesus warns that when the end comes, those in Judea must flee to the mountains. The one on the mountaintop must not go down or into the house or take anything away. The one in the field must not turn back to get a coat. Woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing infants in those days. Pray that it may not be in winter. For in those days there will be suffering such as not been seen from the beginning of the creation that God created until now. No, and never will be. They are enduring siege. People dying of starvation and thirst. 
and the fall of the city, the destruction of Jerusalem would have been a terrible time with rape and pillaging of destruction. The readers of Mark knew these horrors. There's a way in which the apocalypse, the revelation that Jesus describes here, gives meaning and purpose to their suffering. Their sufferings are the birth pangs of a new reality. Now, it's also important to remember that these first readers of Mark knew Jesus. Many of them knew him personally. They would have met him during his ministry. He taught in their synagogues. He healed their sick. He fed thousands in the wilderness. He showed a new way to love God by participating in God's love, by expressing God's love with our whole being. And then he was crucified, died, and wonderfully rose again. They had both the blessing of the presence of Christ and the pain of the loss of Christ. And now, as their world is being torn apart, Jesus offers a new hope. Christ will come again. We too start Advent with the hope that comes from knowing that Christ has come and has shown us the way of love. Like the first readers of Mark, we live in a time of great suffering with racial injustice, global pandemic, and climate change creating terrible suffering. How are we to be faithful to Christ in this time? Christ has come and Christ will come again, but the world is broken. People are suffering. Jesus teaches them and us how to live as we wait expectantly, watching for the coming of Christ. He says, it is like a man going on a journey when he leaves his home and puts his slaves in charge, each with his work, and commands the doorkeeper to be on the watch. Therefore keep awake, for you do not know when the master of the house will come, in the evening, or at midnight, or at cockcrow, or at dawn, or else he may find you asleep when he comes suddenly. And what I say to you, I say to all, keep awake. Keep awake. Watch for the return of Christ. Keep awake. Watch for injustice and speak out against it. Keep awake, watch for the signs of prejudice, of racial injustice, of institutionalized racism around us, and do something about it. Keep awake and watch for the damages of climate change, and do your part. Let's all do our part to do something about it. Keep awake. Jesus promised that the generation of the first disciples would not pass away before these things came to pass, and they did come to pass. Jerusalem fell, the temple was destroyed, and he said, keep awake, because he promised that the Son of Man, the Christ, is coming. And that also is true. Christ is coming. The kingdom of God has drawn near. The kingdom of God is beginning to break into this reality. We can know the kingdom of God in our own lives. We can participate in the kingdom of God in the reality of that kingdom. And how do we do that? We keep awake. We watch for the presence of Christ in others. We watch for the presence of Christ in those who have been marginalized. 
We watch for the presence of Christ by looking at the needs of others. Keep awake. The suffering of this age is real, but the promise of Christ is real too. Our challenge, like the challenge of those early disciples, is to learn to see Christ. Keep awake. Look for Christ in each stranger that you meet. Strive to be aware of the vulnerability and need of those around you. Strive to see what is divine within each person you encounter. Look for Christ. Keep awake. Keep awake. Be honest about your own vulnerability and your own need. And be open when we see that need and vulnerability in you, when we bring Christ to you. Keep awake. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come.